Revelation chapter 2, right, Revelation chapter 2, and uh, tonight I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give this my best shot of finishing up this section because I really want to get it done and move on uh, so we can get through the seven letters to the seven churches so we can move into the rest of the book of Revelation. So uh, tonight we're going to be picking up where we left off the last couple times in verse 14, uh, but right now what we're doing is we're looking at this second section of the book of Revelation which is Jesus' words to the seven churches in Asia, or today would be the uh, western and southern part of Asia, uh, of Turkey, modern-day Turkey, which then was Asia Minor, and particularly Asia, meaning the Asian province, the Roman province of Asia. So anyhow, Jesus is giving John words and messages for each angel of the church of each one of these seven churches. And again, as we've said, the word angel here, meaning messenger, is probably most likely referring to the human messenger of that church, which would be most likely the pastor. So the Lord's got some words to say to the pastor of the church concerning the church uh, that he is overseeing. And the church doesn't belong to the pastor. Let's just get that straight, okay? The church doesn't belong to the pastor. The church belongs to Jesus. A pastor is just an under-shepherd, okay? He's not the chief shepherd. That's Jesus. And so Jesus has some words to say to these churches. And uh, these letters are, most of them are very similar. There's a few uh, that um, are a little different in the points that Jesus makes. Uh, but they're similar in the sense of their content and what Jesus is saying to them. And so... What we're looking at right now here in verses 12 through 17 is Jesus' words and his letter to the church at Pergamos. Now, I'm using the New King James Version. It says Pergamos. Some of your Bibles may say Pergamum or Pergamon. It's all the same uh, city. It's all the same place. Um, it's just that uh, Pergamos is the literal Greek uh, for this word, okay? And um, so that's why some of your Bibles say Pergamon or Pergamum uh, because one of them is Latin, and I don't want to get into all that, but it's all the same. So this is where we're at. And we're going we're gonna to pick up here in verse 14 because that's where we've left off. If you haven't been with us or if you've missed any of these studies since verse 12, you can go to our YouTube channel. They're all there, and you can get caught up uh, on Jesus' words to the church at Pergamus. But if you remember, where we're at right now is in verse 14 and 15. What Jesus is doing is he's giving this church words of correction or words of condemnation. Uh, not all the churches have these words. There's a couple that don't. Uh, actually, just two of them that don't, but the rest do. And so in giving them words of correction, what Jesus is doing is he's telling these churches... After he tells them what is right, after he gives them a word of commendation, here's what you've got right, here's what you're doing right, he then gives them a word of correction or a word of condemnation in the sense that he's telling them now what you have wrong, what's going wrong in your midst or in your congregation. And so that's where we're at here in verse 14. The only two churches that don't have a word of correction or a word of condemnation um, is the church at Smyrna, the Suffering Church, and also the Church of Philadelphia. Those are the only two that don't have this uh, element in their letters. So here we're looking at the Church of Pergamos, and this is the compromising church. And so if you would look at verse 14, Jesus says, But I have a few things against you. Now when you compare that to the last time he mentioned that, which was up in verse, I'm sorry, up in his letter, uh, to the church at Ephesus, he told the church at Ephesus that he had something against them. He had one thing against them. Well, this church here, he actually, now when he says this again, it's to the church of Pergamos, and he says, I have a few things against you. And so what Jesus is saying is, even though you have some things right, there's a few things that you have wrong. And so what was it exactly that was wrong in the church of Pergamos? And... If you notice in verses 14 and 15, there's two things that they have wrong. 
they follow or they hold to the doctrine of Balaam and the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which we'll look at that uh, as we go on and get in depth about that a little more. But what these two things that Jesus had against them were very similar in nature. They were basically the same thing. And they were both issues of false doctrine that crept into church that led to compromised living. Their problem was both their belief and their behavior. They tolerated those who believed wrongly and lived sinfully. That was the problem in this church. As I've said before so many times, right, belief always determines behavior. And what you believe will always determine how you behave. Okay? So that's really telling on us, isn't it? Because if we say we believe one thing but we do another, what are we saying? We're saying we don't really believe what we say we believe. You see that? If belief determines behavior and you do what you believe, but you act contrary to what you say you believe, guess what? You don't really believe that. Okay? So it's, this is a very important thing. And so, what happened in this church is false doctrine was coming in, and that's why false doctrine is so, so dangerous. That's why this issue is so important, because what you believe will determine your behavior, how you live. And so, Jesus not only wants us to love him like he told the church at Ephesus, and not only are we called on to suffer for him like the church at Smyrna, but he also wants us to believe the right things so that we live right lives. And so that's the real issue here with this church. Now I want you to notice, because he's going to say it again in verse 15, but Jesus says to them, here in verse 14, but I have a few things against you because you have there those, there, those in the midst of the church. So it's not the whole church was doing this, but there were some there among them. You have those there who hold the doctrine of Balaam. Okay? And we're going to get more deep into that tonight and, and then move on. But what's interesting is the Greek word here for hold is very important because... It refers to, in, in Greek, it refers to a very powerful grip, having a very powerful grip on something, but refusing to let go. Now, the, the fact that Jesus uses that word gives us the idea that Jesus has said something to them about this before through his Holy Spirit, and they're not listening. So now Jesus is saying it louder to them. So some of those in this church were holding tightly to their compromise and continuing to refuse to let go. They just weren't going to let it go. And so he says the first thing that they would not let go was the doctrine of Balaam. Now, last week we looked at Numbers chapters 22 through 24, and we took a look at who this guy Balaam was in the Old Testament. And when you go back to the Old Testament, you see that he basically was a witch. He basically was a wizard, a sorcerer, who had this reputation that he could speak words of curse, cursing upon his enemies, or words of blessing upon his friends. He couldn't do it. What he did, he did through sorcery. Okay? He didn't do it because he was a real prophet of God and God worked through him this way. He had the reputation of being able to do this because of the tricks of his trade. That was it. Balaam in the Old Testament is very akin to and very much like Simon the sorcerer in the book of Acts in chapter 8, if you remember reading about him. These two guys were two peas in the pod. Okay, So they, they gave this idea that they were followers of Yahweh, followers of the true God. Uh, Simon the sorcerer gave this this air that he's a follower of Jesus Christ, but they really weren't um, sincere in their hearts in that. And so, if you remember, when we looked at Numbers chapter 22 through 24, we saw that King Balak of the Moabites, because he was afraid that as Israel was coming through the wilderness and passing by his land, he was afraid that they were going to attack him because of the amount of people they had and that they were going to... You know, take, you know, defeat him in war and take his land and, and, and you know, 
destroy them and take all this stuff for spoil. So he calls on Balaam to come and to curse them for him. Okay? Now, if you remember, in that account in Numbers, Balaam tried three times by using his sorcery to to speak words of cursing upon Israel, but he couldn't do it. And he couldn't do it because, number one, he didn't really have the power to do it, and number two, God had already blessed Israel, and he realized that because they were so blessed, he couldn't curse them even if he, if he wanted to. Okay? And so after three times of trying to curse Israel, he finally gives up. And instead, what God does is God puts a word of blessing every time in his mouth to speak over Israel, which made Balak very mad because he's not getting what he paid for. Okay? And so, it's very interesting because as hard as Balaam tried to curse Israel, he couldn't. God had blessed them. So God actually put words of blessing in Balaam's mouth. And so what's interesting is if you wonder about that, well, how could that be? How could God put words of cursing, or I'm sorry, words of blessing in the mouth of a false prophet, in the mouth of a wizard, a sorcerer, to bless his people. If you've got a problem with God using someone like that, let me just say this. Do you remember earlier in the story, before that ever happened, God used the donkey to talk to Balaam. Okay? So if God can use a donkey and speak, you know where I'm going, right? He can use anybody. He, he can use you and me <laughs> and Balaam. So I don't, have a, I don't have a problem at all when I, read the, you know, when I read that account that God put words of blessing in the mouth of a false prophet to speak over his people. Praise God for that. You know, I think about in the Old Testament where it says that um, whenever a, a man's ways are pleasing to the Lord, the Lord will even uh, make him at peace with his enemies. That's what God did for Israel. You know, Balaam was rising up as Balaam and Balak was rising up as an enemy against Israel, and God was like, "You know what? They're my people. I've blessed them. All you can do is speak blessing over them." So here's the deal. So if you remember, Balaam was a for profit, false prophet, right? He was in it for the money. The New Testament attests to this facts, this fact as well. And so what's interesting is, whenever Balaam could not come through on his end of the deal of cursing Israel, Balaam says, hey, Balak, I can't curse Israel, but I can teach you how to curse them. And the reason I share all that is because that brings us to verse 14, right? Jesus says, but I have a few things against you because you have there those who hold the doctrine of Balaam. Notice this, who taught Balak. Do you see that? So Balaam couldn't curse Israel. But because he still wanted paid on a job he couldn't deliver on, he tried to come up with a way to curse Israel. And he says, I've got it. And I can teach it to you for just a small fee of $19.95. Plus, you know, it sounds like an infomercial, really. What happened between Balaam and Balak sounds like an infomercial. You know, call now and uh, learn my tricks of the trade, my secrets. You know, how you can be successful over the nation of Israel from defeating you, you know. Anyway. That's what comes to my mind when I think about this. And so that's why Jesus says here that he mentions the doctrine of Balaam who taught Balak to put a stumbling block before the children of Israel. And what was that stumbling block or what was the result of that stumbling block? Look at verse 14. To eat things sacrificed to idols and to commit sexual immorality. Okay? So let's go through these words for a moment and then... Last week we read it very quickly, but we're going to go back to Numbers 25 and just look at a couple verses so you can see this more clearly. But I want you to look at verse 14, and I want you to look first of all at the word doctrine. The word doctrine appears over 30 times in the New Testament, 
And it's simply, in its simplest form, it just means teaching or instruction. The word doctrine is not a bad word. And we talked about that in a previous study, how doctrine is very important to us as believers. Okay? Doctrine, correct doctrine tells us what to believe and what we should believe. But what's interesting is the word doctrine here doesn't only simply mean teaching or instruction, but it also includes, and this is important as we go on, it also, this word also includes application. Not just here's the information, but here's the application of it. This word refers not only to teaching, but to how to apply the teaching. You guys know this, right? I mean, do you understand that if you come to church and all you do is take in information and knowledge, but you don't know how to apply that knowledge and that information to your life, it's not going to help you. A lot of Christians come to church and they take, you know, if you come to a good Bible teaching church, you're going to learn and you take in information. But if you don't live it out, if you don't apply it to your life, the book of James actually tells us, James said you actually deceive yourself. Never think Bible knowledge, okay, is a replacement for Bible living. If you come to church here and you, all you do is listen to what I say and, and you learn what the Bible says and you hear what God has to say and, and you're learning it and you, you know it in your head, but it never reaches to your heart in the sense that you live it out and apply it to your life, it's not doing you any good. Actually, it's doing you harm. Did you know that one of the most dangerous places to come to on a regular basis is church? Did you know that? One of the most dangerous places to come on a regular basis is to church. Because if you come to church and you only hear the Bible being taught, but you don't apply it to your life, that is dangerous to your spiritual life because what it will do, it will give you a false sense of security. Just because you think you, because you, think you know the Bible, a lot of people interpret that for a right life. God's pleased with me because I know what the Bible says. Really? Satan knows what the Bible says. Satan knows what the Bible says so well that in the Bible he quotes it. I would venture to say Satan probably knows the Bible more than some of you here, if not all of us. Okay? So you have to apply the Scriptures for them to take effect in your life or they're not going to do you any good. What you do, according to James, is if you're a hearer only, if you come and to church and all you do is hear it and listen to it, but you don't do it, you don't obey it, James says, those who are hearers only and not doers, they deceive themselves. Okay? You deceive yourself. There is a deception in coming to a Bible teaching church and thinking that because I'm taking the Bible in and I'm learning the Bible and I have knowledge of the Bible, that that's a substitute for me living right and applying it. It's not. And I'll be the first to tell you that. Now, I don't want you to stop coming to church. I want you to start applying what you're learning. But I will be the first to tell you that if you just come and all you're doing is just, you're just filling your head full of Bible knowledge, you're wasting your time. It's not going to do you any good. In fact, it's going to do you harm. It's going to be, you're going to deceive yourself into thinking, because I go to church, because I listen to the Bible, because I do these things, that I'm right with God. That he's pleased with my life. No, that's not the case at all. You have to live it out. You have to apply it. That's why this word doctrine is so important. It doesn't just refer just to, in a simple form, it refers to teaching and instruction, but it goes further than that. It, it speaks also of the applying of it, okay? It's, it's the same word that's used, listen, in Greek it's the same word that's used to describe a masterful teacher who would teach his knowledge to an apprentice. Some of you guys in the trades, some of you guys who have jobs where you're in trades where you know, you've went through the different levels and you've been, you were an apprentice and you had a, you know, a master craftsman show you 
give you knowledge about something and then show you how to do it, you know what I'm talking about. This is what we're talking about. So this word also, or the same word describes a master actually showing his apprentice how to apply what he's learned and what he's taught him. And this definition implies the teacher would demonstrate to the apprentice how to apply the teaching and put it into practice. Now go back to verse 14 and notice that. The doctrine of Balaam. See that? The doctrine of Balaam who taught Balak. Balaam here is the master and Balak is the apprentice. See? And again, the word taught here simply means to teach or to instruct or prescribe. And again, that word taught, which comes from this same word, it actually was used primarily to describe the relationship between a teacher and a pupil, between a master and an apprentice. Okay? So that's what's going on here. So what in the doctrine of Balaam, in, in Balaam's teaching and him teaching Balak how to apply this, what was it? What did he do? Well, notice what he says. He, put, he taught him to put a stumbling block before the children of Israel. Do you see that? Now, what's interesting is, see the words to put? They literally mean to cast, okay? To cast or literally to throw or to hurl. To get something in front of them, okay, very quickly and to get it there right now, all right? To throw something or to hurl something in front of somebody. And it carries the idea or the element of surprise, okay? This word, to put or to cast, means to throw or to hurl in front of someone in order to catch them off guard, to surprise them with something, okay? And notice what, what is Balaam teaching Balak to cast or to throw or to hurl in front of the Israelites? A stumbling block, it says. You see that? And the word stumbling block here refers to a trap that's used to catch an animal, you know? And so what's interesting is the word stumbling block here is, is the Greek word scandalon, and I know you've seen in, if, you know, years ago, right, if you watched cartoons, I know you've seen this type of thing where, you know, you, you know somebody's trying to catch, you know, uh, Elmer Fudd's trying to catch Bugs Bunny, you know, or Wile E. Coyote's trying to catch the Roadrunner, that type of stuff. You ever seen this thing where there's a box and then the box is tilted up and in the box, let's say for Bugs Bunny, is a carrot under the box. And then there's a stick holding up one end of the box that has a rope on it, right? That stick holding up that box that has the rope on it is the stumbling block. That's, that's the scandal on. So the idea is when the animal, or let's say Bugs Bunny, goes underneath the box to get the carrot, the idea would be to, to pull the rope to pull the stick, and the box falls down over the animal. Now, today we're a little more sophisticated than that. You know, some of you have got traps that you've used before to catch varmints and, and pests, you know, especially here in, here in the city. Man, we've tried to catch skunks and raccoons and all kinds of animals, uh, groundhogs and everything. I had a groundhog one time trying to, you know, living under my my front porch, and oh, those things are such a pest, you know, and uh, I've borrowed traps off people before. I think, Jeff, didn't I borrow a trap off you one time? Did I never did? It was somebody else here. Yeah, I borrowed tra So, but the traps that we use today are a little more sophisticated. It doesn't have a stick and a rope, but it's the same idea. You know what I'm saying? They're, the door has a certain kind of mechanism that holds it open, you put the bait or the food inside the, you know, back inside the trap so when the animal goes in and goes so far in, it's going to set off the trap and close it and you got your varmint, right? That's this word. That's the word stumbling block here. And 
When this word is used in the New Testament, the word scandalon, when it's used in the New Testament, it's used usually to describe an enticement to sin. Okay? So in the New Testament, this word is usually used to describe an enticement to sin. Paul uses it in Romans 14, verse 13. Let me read it to you. Paul says, Therefore, let us not judge one another anymore, but rather resolve this, not to put a stumbling block, there it is, same word, scandalon, or a, get this, cause to fall in our brother's way. See, if you consider yourself a strong Christian, a mature Christian, okay, and you have certain liberties, certain things that you do in your life that doesn't bother your conscience, but in your midst, in your church, in your circles, there's another brother in the Lord who is not as strong in his faith and his conscience where he can't take part in something that you do, then you shouldn't take part of it in front of him because if you do, you're setting a stumbling block in his way. You're, 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 you're giving him a cause to fall. Paul says don't do that. See? Balaam taught Balak how to put a stumbling block, a cause to fall in the way of the Israelites. And Paul says, as believers, let's not do that to each other. You know what I'm saying? For instance, let's just, we'll, this is the easy one, right? Uh, you know, as, as American Christians... If you feel as a Christian, if you're strong in the faith, you're strong in your convictions, and if you feel you have the liberty to drink alcohol, okay? Now, is drinking alcohol a sin for a Christian? I would say it depends on who you are. According to the Bible, it's not a sin to drink alcohol. There's nothing wrong with having a glass of wine with your dinner, guy comes home from work, he wants a cold beer, is there a sin in that act? No, there's not. Okay? Now, Jesus made this clear when he talked about eating and drinking things. He says it's not what goes into your stomach that eventually becomes eliminated that's sinful. It's what is in your heart that comes out your mouth that's sinful. It's not what goes into your mouth. It's what comes out that's sinful, okay? But let me say this. To balance that out, if you look at the Old Testament, especially the book of Proverbs, Solomon will give you many reasons, okay? By the way, who used to be a king of the, king of the Israelites, right? Used to be the king of Israel. Gives many reasons why it's wise not to partake in alcohol, okay? But let me say this. If you as a believer who are, consider yourself a strong believer, who has, you know, you're, you're strong in your conscience and such, and you feel the liberty to partake in alcohol without getting drunk, drunkenness is a sin. If you drink to the point where you get drunk, then you just forfeited your right to any alcohol. Okay? But if you're that person who can partake in it without letting it control you, biblically it's not a sin. But if you have other brothers in the church that used to be drunkards, used to be drunks, and they're tempted with it, I mean, you drink one beer, guess what? You're fine. He drinks one beer, he's back to being a drunk again. You see what I'm saying? If a strong Christian drinks a beer in front of a weaker Christian and that weaker Christian falls into sin, you just put a stumbling block in his way by doing that in front of him and, and, and partaking in that in front of him. You, it, what were you doing? You were literally teaching him how to curse himself. <laughs> See, that's what Balaam did here, okay? Now, I didn't mean to get on a teaching about drinking, okay? So if you have any questions about that after church, come and see me. I don't want to argue about it because I know everybody here, most people have very strong feelings when it comes to alcohol. I have strong feelings about it. Uh, I, was, I was raised uh, for part of my life with a drunk in the house. Okay? Uh, I don't drink. I never was a drinker. 
never been drunk in my life. And as a pastor, I'm to abstain from alcohol anyway. Okay? So I'm like, you know the best way not to get drunk? Don't drink. Problem solved. That's, what I, that's my advice to you. But if we're going to get theological about the issue, I know what the Bible says about it. And I'm not going to tell you because, you know, I, I, number one, can't drink or number two, wouldn't drink. I wouldn't tell you you can't. But I would say be very careful if you're going to partake in that because you don't want to stumble another brother. You want to put a cause to fall in his way. Okay? So I just use that as an example. Okay? To kind of tell you what Balaam was doing here. And Jesus didn't like this. Jesus didn't like it. Now, look what he says here. He says that what he did is he put a stumbling block before the children of Israel. You see that? In the Greek, the word before here literally means within the sight of. Within the sight of. And it's the picture of dangling bait, okay, before someone to lure them out. Those of you guys that fish know exactly what this is. You know, when you fish, you're trying to do what? You're trying to put the bait before or in the sight of the fish to lure him to it, right? So that's what Balaam taught Balak to do to the children of Israel. Okay, so here in verse 14, that's the Greek idea to these words. Okay, so do you see the idea here? So the doctrine of Balaam wasn't just something... It wasn't just information, but it was application where Balaam as the master taught Balak as the apprentice how to draw the Israelites out by, putting, by setting a trap for them by dangling bait in front of them. So, what was it? We'll go back to Numbers 20, chapter 25. Numbers 25. We're just going to look at a few verses. Last week we read them, and I didn't comment on them because we ran out of time. But I'm hoping that now that you understand what all those words mean and the idea there to the doctrine of Balaam, when you turn now to Numbers 25 and just look at the first three verses, you'll have a better understanding of what we're talking about and what Jesus is saying here. Look at Numbers chapter 25. Look at verse 1. Now Israel remained in Acacia Grove. Okay? Now notice, between verse 25 of chapter 24 and verse 1 of chapter 25, it says nothing about what Jesus talks about back in Revelation 2.14, does it? After Balaam was unsuccessful in cursing the children of Israel and instead spoke that last word of blessing over them, all it says is, so Balaam rose and departed and returned to his place, and Balak went his way. It seems like those two guys just split up, and that was the end of it. Then we have this story in chapter 25. Well, Jesus, in Revelation 2.14, is giving us information and is telling us what happened between chapter 24 and 25. Balaam, because he wanted the money, came up with a way and taught Balak how to set a trap for the Israelites, okay, by teaching him what to lure them with. Here it is. Israel remained in Acacia Grove. See those words, Acacia Grove? Your Bible may say Shittim with a capital S, right? Shittim. Shittim wood or Acacia wood is the same kind of wood. What's the big deal with Acacia Grove? Well, you have to remember, when it came to the worship of false gods in ancient times, one of the places where they would gather to worship these false gods like Baal is in these groves of trees. Acacia Grove, what was there? Why, what is going on there? What is there is an altar as an altar and a place of worship to Baal or Baal. See? The false god, the false Canaanite Phoenician god. And so 
Israel somehow ended up in a place where they should have never been. They're, they're at a place used as a temple or an altar, a place there to worship this false god Baal. So number one, Israel is somewhere they should have never been. Okay? Number two, look what it says. And the people, the people, this is Israel, begin to commit harlotry with the women of Moab. So what Balak did at the advice of Balaam, Balaam taught Balak, right, to lure the men of Israel out with some bait that would become a trap to ensnare them that would cause God, their their own God, to curse them. And the bait were the women of Moab. Isn't that amazing? Do you remember what the Lord told Israel a few different times back in the law? For instance, Deuteronomy chapter 7. The Lord told Israel, do not, do not marry the women of the other pagan nations. Don't do it. Don't intermarry. He told the Israelites, don't intermarry with the people of the other nations. It had nothing to do with race. It had everything to do with religion because God knew that if the Israelite men took pagan wives, those pagan wives would influence those Israelite men to worship their false gods. And, of course, they would be be committing then spiritual adultery, spiritual harlotry against God by committing idolatry. Always remember that in the Old Testament. Idolatry is spiritual adultery or spiritual harlotry against God. Okay? But before the spiritual harlotry takes place, the physical harlotry takes place. See? You married someone you shouldn't have married. Uh, In the New Testament, it's called being, being unequally yoked. See? Paul deals with this with the Corinthians. It says, don't marry anybody less than a strong believer. See, if you're a Christian. And so, as you look at this, you see that the people began to commit harlotry with the women. So the women were the bait. And that, those women lured as they came out (laughs) to this place of pagan worship, this place of worship for Baal, In their worship of this false god, the women came out naked and pranced and danced around. So Balak cast or threw or hurled this stumbling block in front of Israel by sending these women out there. Okay? Plus, they were at a place they should have never been because always remember, connected to the worship of all of these false gods, is connected to that is always some sort of fleshly gratification that people desire or look for, okay? So that's why, I mean, even in, in, in the Old Testament and then even in the New Testament times with the Roman and the Greek uh, cultures, all of these pagan gods, what was connected to the worship of these pagan gods was always sinful acts of behavior that gratified men's flesh. Okay? So, for instance, if you were going to worship the Greek god Bacchus, Bacchus is the Greek god of wine. Uh, His his name is also uh, Dionysus. In fact, in Pergamos, there was a temple of Dionysus, and he was the god of wine. So when you went to the temple of Bacchus or Dionysus to worship him and to venerate him, guess what you would do? Take part in wine until you were sloshed. You would get drunk. That's what you would do. When you would go to the temple of some fertility god or goddess, guess what you would do? You would have sexual relations with the temple prostitutes that were there. And some of those temples, again, in the Old Testament and in in the New Testament times, 
there were men prostitutes and women prostitutes. So when you went to go worship a god or a goddess like in the Old Testament, like Ashtaroth, she was a fertility goddess. When you would go to worship her, you would take part in having sex with the temple prostitutes. What I'm saying is the worship of all of these false gods, what was connected to them was some sort of sinful behavior, okay, that gratified men's flesh. That's why these people were so drawn to these false gods. See, we we think about it today and we're like, how could the Israelites have been so stupid to worship a god made out of wood or stone? I mean, they were just dumb, weren't they? Or how could the Romans and the Greeks in the New Testament times, you know, done the same thing, worship these gods that are made of wood and stone? That's not all that was going on there, people. <laughs> what was going on there wasn't so much about the wood and the stone. It was about how we worship that god. Do you see that? So Israel is at a place they should have never been, and as a result of that, they do what they should have never done. And so the men of Israel were drawn out by these women that were put before them. And what did they do? They committed harlotry with them. They had sex with them. And look what it says in verse uh, verse 2. They invited, that's the, the women of Moab, they invited the people, that's Israel, to sacrifice, to the sacrifice of their gods. Do you see what happened? What came first? Hmm? The harlotry. The sex came first. What came next? Sacrificing to their gods. Do you see that? Do you see how that works? Yeah. That's why God told the Israelites, do not intermarry with these pagan nations. They, they, those women you marry, or those men you marry, will lead your heart away through sex, through emotion, okay? And they'll lead you away eventually to sacrifice to their gods and lead you into idolatry. So physical harlotry turns into spiritual harlotry against God. You got that? That's what's going on here. And so it says that they invited the people to the sacrifices of their gods and the people, this is Israel, guess what they did? Look what it says. They ate. What's that mean? That means like a fish, they took the bait, hook, line, and sinker. And they're eating food, sacrificed to these false gods, to these idols. Which again, is spiritual harlotry, spiritual adultery against their God, whom they belong to. Who God, whom God rescued from Egypt delivered from Egypt, brought them to himself at Mount Sinai to be his people. He gave them a land. He gave them a law and said, you're my people, and I'm your God, and I'm a jealous God. I'm jealous not for you, but I'm jealous over, or jealous of you, but jealous for you, jealous over you, like a husband is for his wife. And that's why he told them, listen, don't get mixed up with these pagan nations. And that's what they did. Over and over and over in their history, didn't they? Yeah. And so, notice what it says. The people ate. They bowed down to their gods. They're they're all in now. Here's the Israelites worshiping these false gods, worshiping the idols of Baal or Baal or Baal. Look at verse 3. So Israel was joined to Baal of Peor. You see that? They're all in now. They've been deceived. And look what it says. Verse 3, And the anger of the Lord was aroused against Israel. Just the way the anger of a husband would be toward his wife who committed adultery against him, God is angry at his wife, Israel, his people for doing this. And if you keep reading, we looked at it, we looked at it last week, but if you keep reading, you will see that the people brought a curse upon themselves. 
Okay? They brought a curse upon themselves. And it says in verse 9, And those who died in the plague were 24,000. What Balaam couldn't do through his sorcery, Balak was able to do, okay, through what Balaam taught him. See? And that was to bring a curse upon themselves. So, man, what a lesson. What a lesson. So go back with me to Revelation chapter 2. So, when it comes down to this, what... What is the doctrine of Balaam? The doctrine of Balaam is idolatry and sexual immorality. That's the doctrine of Balaam. And so this church, this Christian church in Pergamos had people in it that were saying, it's okay as a Christian to go to these pagan temples. And to take part in what they're doing. Why they're going to church. The, the, the believers at, some of the believers at Pergamos were sacrificing things to these idols. Or I'm sorry, were eating things, sacrificed to these idols. And taking part in sexual immorality at these pagan temples. And again, remember when we first started our study of Pergamos... Pergamos was loaded with all sorts of these pagan temples. Okay? And, and also, Pergamos had a few theaters, huge theaters, where they would have events where people would go and you would just get drunk, you know? <laughs> kind of like Bush Stadium on steroids. You know, one time I was at Bush Stadium with, with my son. I think it was me and Matt. Years ago, we were sitting in the bleachers at the old Bush Stadium. This guy had drunk so much at the ball game that he pooped his pants. And we're sitting there and we're going, wow. And we're like looking, looking around for like a baby. Is there a baby around here that's, you know, done number two and they need to change it it was that bad it was horrible and finally we looked down on the bleachers not far from us there's a guy who had drunk so much that he did number two in his pants and so many people complained that they finally had to take him out of there but I've been to ball games where man people just get sloshed well that's what was happening in Pergamos when they would go to these theaters same thing so Believers in Pergamos were being tempted to go to these places and to take part in this kind of stuff. Okay? To go to these theaters and, 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 and watch things happen in the theater that they should not be watching. And to go to these pagan temples and to take part in sexual immorality and, and other things. Like going to the temple of Asclepius looking for healing instead of coming to the elders of the church and letting them pray for them? You see what I'm saying? So the compromising that was going on in Pergamos was there were those in the church that were believing and were holding on to the idea that we can be Christians, but we can let our guard down and we can kind of mix with the world a little more. We don't have to be so stuffy. We don't have to be so strict. We don't have to be so legalistic about where we go, what we do, what we watch, what we take part in. We can loosen up a little bit. After all, aren't we here to be a light and to try to reach the world anyway? Yeah, if we're going to, then we need to get out there where they're at and do the things they do. That was the mindset in Pergamos. See? That was the doctrine of Balaam. Okay? Are we good? You with? All right, let's move on. The second of Jesus' two concerns about this church was the doctrine of Nicolaitans. Look at verse 15. He says, Thus you also have those who hold... There's that word again. They've got a, they've got a tight grip on and they will not let this go. Who hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans. Notice what Jesus says, Which thing I hate. 
which thing I hate. You see that? Now, again, the Greek word here for hold means to have a powerful grip and a refusal to let it go. Okay? Now, what is the doctrine of the Nicolaitans? What's, what's being said here? What is Jesus so opposed to that they're doing? Well, the doctrine of Nicolaitans was almost mirrored with the doctrine of Balaam. Okay? But there's, there's two ideas behind this, and I'm going to give them to you in a moment. But the word Nicolaitans here is a compound of two Greek words. The Greek word Nike, N-I-K-E. What's that spell in English? Yeah, this is where the word Nike comes from. And the word Nike in Greek means to conquer, to be a victor, to conquer. And the word Laos, or Laos, 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 means laity, or literally people. So if you put those two words together, it literally mean, it literally becomes the word Nikolaos, Laos, Nikolaos, it's hard to say, or Nicolaitan, okay? Which means one who conquers or subdues people. Okay? So who were the Nicolaitans? Well, I'll give you, I'll give you two ideas that Bible scholars bring up, that good, reputable Bible scholars bring up here. Number one, some have suggested, for good reason, that they were professional clergymen, okay, who lorded the ministry over the laity. These were church leaders, okay, who oversaw the church in such a way where they lorded it over the people for their own benefit. Now, that never happens anymore, does it? Pastors and preachers and priests never do that sort of thing anymore, so we're glad we're rid of this doctrine, right? Yeah, right. <laughs> so that's one idea. And you know, this makes a lot of sense. Because if you notice, the two problems in this church are problems that Jesus calls what? Doctrines. Teachings. So where are these doctrines and teachings coming from? Who are they being promoted by? Probably the pastor or the elders, the church leadership. See? And so they're the ones promoting, possibly, very possibly, all of this compromise, all this, I'm sorry, all this false teaching that's producing the compromise in this church very well could be a leadership problem at this church. These pop people are leading, lording the ministry over them. And at the same time, they're leading them into an excessive lifestyle of sin. Listen, preachers and pastors do that stuff all the time. Sad to say. Sad to say. But they do. And priests as well. Another idea behind this word Nicolaitans also, others say that what they were were those who followed a man by the name of Nicholas. Now, I shared this with you, I think, uh, when we were going through... Um, Jesus' letter to the church at Ephesus. Because if you notice back in verse, um, let me see here, in verse 6 of chapter 2, in Jesus' words to the church of Ephesus, he says, But this you have, that you hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. You see that? So Jesus hated the doctrine of, the teaching and the application of the doctrine of Nicolaitans, he hated that, and he hated the deeds. He hated what the kind of life it produced. Holding to that doctrine, he hated the life that it produced as well. You see that? And so get this straight. Jesus did not hate the Nicolaitans. He hated their doctrine. He hated their deeds. 
He didn't hate them because they were believers. And that's why he takes the time to write this letter to try to give them an opportunity to repent. Okay? You with me? Okay. So, the Nicolaitans were those who followed Nicholas of Antioch. Now, who's Nicholas of Antioch? Well, if you go back, and don't turn there, but if you go back to Acts chapter 6, you'll find out that he was one of the original deacons, one of the first deacons mentioned in Acts chapter 6, verse 5. And what people believe or what Bible scholars believe and historians believe is at some point what happened to him is he started propagating the false teaching and the false idea of extreme grace. In other words, you can sin as much as you want as a Christian because God will forgive you if you ask Him. So the Nicolaitans were people who had no problem exercising Christian freedom. See? They, they loved Paul's words where Paul said, all things are lawful for me. They went, fantastic. We can do whatever we want. Now they ignored, ignored Paul's words where he said, all things are lawful for me, but not all things are helpful. Not all things are profitable. All things are lawful for me, but I won't be brought under the power of any. They, they left those words out. They just took the first part. All things are lawful. Great. These, these were the kind of people that Paul addressed in Rome, in Romans chapter 6. Remember the end of Romans 5? Paul says, where sin abounds, grace does much more abound. And to, all, to that, we all as believers would say, praise God. But then there were those in Rome who said, well, if that's true, if, if where sin abounds, grace abounds then why don't we go ahead and sin so God can send more grace to us. He can give us more forgiveness. See? How did Paul answer that? Romans chapter 6, verse 1. Should we continue in sin that grace may abound? Paul said, God forbid, let it never be. See? This is what the Nicolaitans were teaching. In other words, just like the doctrine of Balaam, they were like, hey, it's okay to go to the theater, man. Drink it up with your buddies. It's okay to go to the theater and watch Christians get killed. <laughs> it's okay to go to the theater and watch stuff and take part in stuff you shouldn't. It's okay to go with your buddies to the, to the pagan temples and take part in the sexual immorality and take part in the drinking and the carousing and all of that because you're saved. You're a Christian. You're saved by grace. That's the kind of people these people were. In fact, Irenaeus was an early church father from the second century. And here's what he wrote about the Nicolaitans. He said that the Nicolaitans promoted fornication, which fornication is sexual immorality, and a compromising position on eating foods sacrificed to idols leading many into an unrestrained carnal lifestyle. That was the doctrine of Nicolaitans. Hey, you're saved by grace. All things are lawful for you, so live it up. God's a forgiving God. Grace covers everything. You know? Well, what did Jesus say about it? Look at verse 15. Thus you, ha you also have those who hold the doctrine of Nicolaitans, which thing I, what? Hate. Guys, the word hate here is a strong word. It means to detest. Jesus just said in chapter 2, verse 6, he hates the deeds of Nicolaitans, same word. And he, and he hates the deeds... And he hates the doctrine. He hates the teaching, the idea of it, and he hates what it leads to. Hates it, detests it. The word hate here means to hate, to abhor, or to find utterly repulsive. Wow. Man. To think that as a Christian, 
I could live in such a way, I could believe something, and then because of that belief would cause behavior in my life that Jesus himself would detest, would hate, would abhor. It's just unbelievable, isn't it? But it's possible. It's possible. Now, we don't have time. I almost made it. Almost made it. So we're going to have to quit right there. But guys, let me, let me tell you what. You know, here in America, um, the last several years, you know, there's, there's been teaching. There has been teaching um, in churches that has mirrored this. Uh, those who, you don't hear much, too much about it anymore, but those of you who know and you've heard the terms emerging church, this is part of the, this is part of the, um, the doctrine of Nicolaitans. Because what those who are part of the emerging church do is they water down truth. There is no absolute truth. Truth is relative. And because of that, you know, the Bible isn't the inerrant word of God. So the Bible doesn't have the authority that, you know, real believers say it has. So they undermine the authority of, of the word of God. And with that, you know, they, 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 they take important Bible doctrines and just whittle them away. And replace them instead with things like, well, instead of preaching and teaching doctrine from the Bible, instead, let's have a conversation about God type of thing. And that kind of believing, whittling away at, at correct biblical doctrine leads to wrong living. And also, uh, you know, along with that, another idea. Um, and I, I don't want to mention names because I just don't want to, I don't want to be, I don't want to do that. But there are those in America who have also taught this extreme grace teaching. That because you're a believer and because you do not have anything to input into your salvation because it's all God and you're saved by grace, then you can pretty much do whatever you want. And every time there's that kind of teaching, that as a believer, because you're saved by grace, there are no boundaries in the Christian life. Every time you have that kind of teaching, it, it lends itself to wrong living because it's wrong. You know, again, Romans chapter 5, right? Where sin abounds, grace does much more abound. Chapter 6, verse 1, should we sin that grace may abound? Let it never be. <laughs> There's a balance, you know. And so the church of Pergamos, you know, was going through that, the temptation of compromising. And the compromising didn't start with the behavior. It started with the mindset. You know what I'm saying? It, it started with, you know, it, listen, it's okay if we're going to reach the world, we need to be like the world. We need to be where they're at, doing the things they're doing, if we're ever going to reach them. So, and then they use that type of thing to take part in what they take part in. But then what happens is they live the same kind of life. They're not really a light to them. They just mix right in with them. Just like what happened to the Israelites in Numbers 25 with the women of Moab and the people of Moab. You see that? So I hope that makes it clear. Does that make it clear? That's what's behind the doctrine of Balaam and the doctrine of the Nicolaitans. And Jesus says, I hate it. I despise it. I detest it. I abhor it. It's repulsive to me. And so as believers, if there's anything Jesus says to us that it repulses him, it should repulse us as well. It should make us sick at our stomach <laughs> as well. And if so, we should run from it. Which, next... Okay, Jesus is going to give them that very advice. Okay, and so that's where we'll pick up next week. And we'll finish next week, the Church of Pergamos.